Welcome to the Frontier Beyond Fear blog talk radio program. I'm Susan Larison Dan, and I am so happy to welcome you back to what has been a very interesting week so far of spontaneous spontaneous shows. I was going to say spontaneity. Well, that's true, too, um, because I am just so excited in just a moment to be bringing on the line Diane Bischoff-James, who has been on the show before some months ago. And those of you who didn't hear that show, I want to tell you just a little bit about Diane. Um, Those of you in Portland, I will tell you right at the outset that Diane is going to be at the Portland Body Mind Spirit Expo. In fact, I know that draws from both Portland and all of Washington State. Actually, all of Oregon and Washington, I know. So there's a perfect opportunity this weekend to come to the Oregon Convention Center to see Diane in person, and we'll talk more about that. And I'm going to be there, too, and I'm going to have a booth. We'll both have booths. In fact, a number of guests to this show will be there. So at the outset, I just wanted to to let our listeners in this area know about that because that's coming up quick this weekend. Um, A little bit about Diane. Diane really puts... Her, her heart into everything that she does. And her beautiful book, The Real Brass Ring, Change Your Life Course Now, is a book just filled with so many wonderful lessons from her own life experiences. And so it she brings the kind of authenticity to her work that can change lives. Because when we ourselves have experienced a journey, and she's had many in different domains, business, personally, just like all of us, and she's written very honestly about her journey. When we've experienced that, that then can put us in a position to help others. And that's exactly what Diane is doing. She is a life reboot expert. I absolutely love that term. And her book was an award-winning book and was recognized by Aspire Magazine as a top 10 book for 2015. She has really journeyed through so many things that I know many of you will relate to and I relate to personally. She's also a very accomplished person having graduated um, magna cum laude from it, with an MS in Integrated Marketing Communications and a BA in psychology. Um, she was very successful in business and still is. She's she's very successful in so many ways. However, she had an experience in the corporate world, which once again I can relate to as well, that caused her to to enter into significant transformation in her life. And she now is a wonderful speaker, teacher, coach, and she's helping people all over the world. So I am just so delighted to bring Diane Bischoff-James on the air. Welcome, Diane. Oh, thank you so much, Susan. I am so, so happy to be here and to talk to you again. Well, I am am just so thrilled that we were able to arrange to do this. And, you know, I had meant to, and I, we had intended a while back to pick up our conversation because the last time you were on the air, um, we just flowed with so many beautiful things. And as I recall, and I'm going to try to put these shows together. For the listeners out there, I'm going to get these shows out on a page because they're going to form a whole is what you're going to see um, in terms of entirety. It's going to be an interesting combination because last time, Diane, we talked a lot about business. And you know, just our journeys through career and business, and and um, you know that whole area. And I'm thinking this time, especially um, since I know this is going to connect to so many people coming to your workshop. I mean, actually, the business and the personal topics today. I'd love to talk about you know some of your personal journeys through relationships, and you know, so many of us can relate to weight loss as well. Um, and so I would just love to talk to you about that aspect of, of your book and your teachings. Oh, that would be great. Food is one of my very favorite topics. <laughs> 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 Food, body, health, and uh, 
how to go through the uh, the cycles that I've been through with yo-yo experiences of that. Yes. So um, that's always yes. fun. Yes, and you know, I know you describe in your book. In fact, we'll we can start there about how you really have had so many experiences throughout your life. And I will tell you, Diane, you know, I'm I'm on that journey of getting my weight where I want it to be. And I tell you what, I am to that point where where I'm. I'm saying, wow, this is working. <laughs> you know that Yay. that we really start to to see significant progress, and um, you know, I just I'm in the midst of that transformation, and I know many women are either wanting to be, or you know, have had lots of ups and downs like you did, and maybe you could tell us your story, Diane, because you know you certainly have been successful. Well. It, it didn't seem that way. Well, when I first started, just so you know, I was at the extreme end of um, uh-huh. on, on the scale. <laughs> I was uh-huh. close to like 190 pounds, and uh-huh. I was about 38, had, a, had had my um, second child at that point, and then it kind of went up even a little bit higher after my third. And I found that, for me, food was everything. Food, I used to constantly think about where am I going to get the next food, next piece of, um, you know, snack. I actually, Susan, I will admit this right now, I hid food all over the house for uh-huh. for no other reason than that's the model my mother had. If you went into, like, the dining room and we went into, you know, the, a, a little cabinet where, we, of course, we only kept the china for holidays, there would be, like, stacks of of sugary treats and and great things we didn't even know existed in the house. So I kind of weirdly learned to be like a squirrel, you know, and kind of like hide things and under my bed. And I mean, so I had crazy, crazy, crazy habits about around food. But the one thing that it was to me, and it it was the number one representation, this is when I was, you know, really heavy, is that food really was love. Food, food was how I got my reinforcement. I used food for the good, the bad, the ugly, everything that happened. And I like to say my best friends at the time yeah. was the hostess family. Because <laughs> if it was a good day, I'd go after like the Twinkies. If it was a, you know, kind of like a, a so-so boring kind of down in the dumps kind of day, I would go for the, the ho-hos. And if it was like a really bad day and the kids came back and they had a scraped up leg or they were having they were having a, the blues or trouble with school or trouble with the teacher, I'd go for the snowballs and you uh-huh. know and the ding dongs. <laughs> so I had the full family here. Yes. <laughs> but as you know, in that relationship with food, when everything was about trying to self soothe with that there's always the dark, dark, dark side of that. So it's that horrible roller coaster. You go up and you're eating the ding dong and it tastes so amazing. And I would have my own little process actually for eating it to peel the chocolate off the top and then go into the inner layer and then, then just shove the rest of my mouth. That feels great. And you know, no less than 15 minutes later, I was in self-loathing because now I just ate something else that I didn't need, wasn't hungry, and just kind of stuffed my face once again. And I, I, I literally hated myself for doing it. So talk about a yo-yo kind of relationship. It was as about as unhealthy as you could get. But I realized that, you know, for those years back then, that's the only thing I knew. I knew that food made me feel better, and most of the rest of my life made me feel bad. So... Yeah. So that's why I went for it, and um, that's kind of how the whole thing started. Um, the The good news is that that doesn't have to be your life. That doesn't have to be how how your relationship is with food or how your relationship is with yourself, because I've you know gloriously been able to lose um, sixty pounds and keep mm-hmm. it off, mm-hmm. and. Honestly, truthfully, 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 I really don't struggle with it anymore. It's um, I struggle more with the mindset of it, but I don't struggle with overeating. The weight stays pretty much at its set point. And so, so the beauty is once you do learn some techniques, and I'd be happy to share, love talking about food and about how to, <laughs> how to get yourself back in balance. And, we can, and I'd love to share all those with you. But the good news is, and here's, here's the carrot out there, uh-huh. You can get your weight 
at a place where you're in harmony with it, where it can feel easy to you, where you get to kind of eat what you want, you know, within within reason, yeah. it is possible to do it. And so I just, you know, I hope that, um, you know, if anything, because I've kind of figured out how, at least in my own little way, how to how to manage it, that I wanted to let everybody know it's totally possible. Because I think yeah. um, when I first started this, I didn't believe that to be true. I really didn't. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I have to say that that um, my experience of the whole thing was I was one of those people when I was younger never had any issues at all for for a very oh. long time, but then something happened. You know, a bunch of things happened at midlife, and it just, you know, including a divorce and other things, different traumatic things I went through, and just midlife. And you know, I think maybe this happens to a lot of us. And then I didn't quite realize, um, you know what what my relationship with food actually had become, I think, is mm-hmm. that when I went through some of those experiences, I I remember when I was first single, um, you know, I was I I was a, a single mother but I still would, would have some nights where it was just me and you know, 'cause my son was going back and forth. And, you know, on some of those nights or if I had a, you know, came back from, from a meeting with the lawyer or something there was Dairy Queen right next <laughs> to my apartment or to my my rental house, and then I had like you know various takeout places where you would get way too much to eat, and and I think you know between that and some other things that influenced it, um, it, it just went the wrong way. And and I'll tell you what, um, I I I mean it when I say you know now I'm really it's taken a while to really get, finally. Finally, I'm seeing, um, you know, like much significant lower set points. You know, it's it's going down, and I'm starting to see what this is like, and and I feel so great. I mean, I think that's something that um, many of us can attest to, is that you really start to feel so much better. Just you know, but but you know, one question I have, Diane, is how do we help women? with loving themselves the entire way. Because even where I'm at now, sometimes I'm getting anxious now. <laughs> and I'm like, not not anxious in the way of, you know, anxiety, but just like, come on, you know, let's get with it. Because now I really want to see even more progress because it's fun. But there's a place there where, you know, it can be frustrating. And, and where do we find our love for ourselves no matter where we are? There are people listening who are on all over that scale. You know, how do we find that love? Well, the the place that I found, and this is the, the biggest shift, the biggest shift for me, because I truly am a food addict completely mm-hmm. and still still am in my head, <laughs> at least in my mind yes. I still can be. So, so first of all, what I had, the first thing you have to do is literally put your arms around yourself where you are. You are where you are. We are all experiencing everything in this life as a growth experience. It's an opportunity to evolve and become your absolute fullest of yourself. And not full like in, you know, larger physical body, but full as in the heart. So a lot of it comes from the place of non-resistance. And I'm sure you've had, you know, so many opportunities to, to talk about this in the past, but when we fight and desperately cling yeah. on to, I want to be less, I wish I was different, mm-hmm. and then the judgment kicks in, it makes all of this much, much, much harder. So I think mm-hmm. the very first place for self-love comes in that moment of self-compassion. Yeah. We yeah. have had, we've all gone through so many big changes. You know, I had the, you know, changing in the career and the divorce and having to try to keep three kids sane through the process. And mm-hmm. keep the business up, but at the same time, try to live um, my passion at the time, which was to get become an actor. And I had to become an yeah. actor and decided to do that when I weighed 190 pounds. Uh-huh. And I That's knew in my head, it was my head was like, there's no actors that are fat. You know, you can't be uh-huh. a fat actor. But I took a moment, literally, of self-compassion, and I said, but you love it. You love just doing anything that has to do with stage so they won't notice. If you love yourself that much, I convinced myself 
that the people who were auditioning me for the very first time wouldn't even notice. (laughs) So it's because I gave myself that moment of compassion, that Mm -hmm. moment of acceptance. And here's the other trick. This is the part that changed everything for me. I think I had lost complete touch with my body. And I think for most people who, who struggle with weight at any place, whether you're 5 pounds up or 50 pounds up or 100 pounds up, there is your body is so perfect on the inside. It knows what the right weight is for it. It knows how to function. It knows how many calories. It's your calculator. Yeah. And what I had completely forgotten when I was grossly overweight is that my body is so smart that I used to try to just kind of plug stuff in my mouth to self-soothe and kind of make me feel better, but Mm -hmm. my body didn't really want the food. So here's the big question, and this is what changed everything. I would ask myself, are you hungry right now? And hungry means literally. Like, you know, you have the growling feeling. Sometimes you can Mm -hmm. hear it. You almost always can feel it. and Or, you know, you, you have some sense of, wow, my stomach is empty and something needs to go in there. So I took it, and this is so fundamental, but I used to say, are you hungry or do you want to chew? Because chewing is different than eating. And then the third part is, are you just trying to make yourself feel better for a few minutes? And I used to try to identify, okay, what's really going on? And I would say about 95% of the time I was not hungry, I had plenty of calories for the day. Do love to chew, and sometimes that's how I release stress through my jaw, and it's not good, you know, probably, but, you know, I have to release it somehow. So I look to, you know, getting um, the little gums, like now they have the new pure gums. They don't have that much sugar, and they don't have any chemicals in them. And I, I let myself chew through the stress to let some of the stress get out. And then the third part is, you know, am I trying to actually just, like you said, stop at the DQ after you've had like a really stressful experience, <laughs> well, I'll be really you think, honest. You know, it, do you even really it's like okay. that very much? But you do. You know, that's the interesting <laughs> thing. You know, is that even really very tastes very good? You know, not necessarily. Well, I mean, I guess but, we grew up with it, and you know, a lot of us did. But um, but yeah, you know, you do things that are that are not even necessarily what you want to do. But those treats are okay, and I think that's the permission base. Let's say you've had like. A super. Sometimes, if I have an audition, I go downtown. I will literally plot out where I'm going to stop, what incredibly fattening thing I'm going to eat. Mm-hmm. You know, I usually go for like a Ben and Jerry's. My my yeah, guys no, are Ben and that Jerry's. Is good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and go Everybody ahead. Agrees. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> and have your cherry. You know, your cherry Garcia, whatever it is. Uh-huh. And the other thing is because you because I give myself permission now to go on these like mini binges. I'm fine with it. I, I, there's no, um, I don't. It seems for some reason like the calories don't stick so much because I don't go crazy. I do have a scoop. If mm-hmm. I do have two scoops, and here's the other trick, I state it to everybody. I'm on a binge. Leave me alone. <laughs> It'll end. <laughs> and then I have like maybe two scoops. If I do the two scoops with the hot fudge and the whipped cream or whatever I'm going to do, I state it as a binge. I have my binge. And then I let it go. So there Uh isn't the, um, I think there isn't the self-bashing that goes along with it. So if you get in touch with your inner system and you're really listening to your guide, talk to your stomach. Are you hungry? And I say this even to my kids now. They'll be sitting, I hear the like, you know how like you're sitting and all of a sudden you hear the cabinets start to get open and close. They're trying to be really quiet. But you know they've had dinner, and you know they're not hungry. And I'll say, yeah. okay, are you hungry? I just, like, shout, are you hungry? <laughs> and they're like, no. <laughs> I'm like, so what are you doing? I need something to eat. I'm like, no, you don't really need something to eat. You probably need something to chew. So we start to, like, at least call it out and bring your awareness mm-hmm. to it in kind of a light, fun way. Don't make it such a huge deal. But, but the trick is once you actually are really in touch with your body, Susan, that's how I lost. I literally started dancing on stage because I was cast in my first show, and I was not focused on how unhappy I had been for so many years. I was finally focused on, you know, what what you're known for, which is so many beautiful posts that you have on Facebook about gratitude and about love and about being in that zone, you know, being in your flow. And that's when I literally I lost 30 pounds in two months. 
because mm-hmm. my, it wasn't my focus anymore. My focus was on how incredibly fun it was to do something I love to do. And so a lot of it, too, is are you really – and, and you can ask yourself, listeners can ask themselves, what would self-love look like right now? What could I do that would just feel awesome and has nothing to do with food? You know, it could be that – we had just had a beautiful day here. We had like a, like an, almost like a 75-degree day in the middle of November. So is it getting outside? Is it taking the walk? Is it sitting by the beach? Is it taking a hike? Whatever you can do that gives you that really high resonant value, that's when the weight starts to fall off. And so um, when you couple those things together, I promise you the weight just kind of will start to melt because the body already knows. And here's here's the funny part, and I feel so bad saying this, but – the body knows that it has one perfect number, and that perfect yeah. number is where you feel good, you feel um, fit, you feel healthy, you know, you kind of like the way you look in the mirror, and you turn around and you're like, um, wow, that looks that dress looks pretty good. You know, it's just kind of that nice figure. Your body already knows what that perfect number is. And yeah. so you, it's not like you have to hit a specific one. It's what resonates really nicely with your body, no matter what it could be. It, it could be 160, it could be 120, it could be whatever whatever works for your particular body and you on your heart on the inside. Mm-hmm. And that's the number you should go for. So it doesn't really matter. It's all about that resonant value of, of the food and your relationship with it. So those are some of my tricks. And I, I, have, I have one other big one, if you don't mind if I share. Sure, I think people are really interested in this. <laughs> <laughs> and all of these in combo melt it melts off literally melts off uh uh-huh. the last one is there's something called gross motor movement okay and what that means is you know the big muscles in your body they've got to move at least twice a week for a minimum minimum of 20 minutes 40 is better but 20 if you really can't fit it in and you're really tight on your schedule um, just a, a 20 minutes. So you have to do gross motor, which means uh, if you jogging if you can or get on the treadmill with a fast walk or climb up a hill or just the stairs in your house, up mm-hmm. and down and up and down and up and down. Because the gross motor, when you start moving the legs and you're moving your, your upper body and you're starting to, you know, move, you know, you know your, your hind end, you know, it, I always think of like the horse. When the horse gets running, the horse is burning like six, 6,000 calories, when we start running like that or just moving really fast and your body knows you're going to do it twice a week, it actually loses weight when you're not exercising. It will continue to burn. So it's kind of like you got your furnace stoked up and then it will work not only when you're doing it, but it will work beyond that. That's what's the cool part about it. So um, I turned, I have a treadmill. It's in my basement. I put a TV in front of it. And because I really do not like walking on the treadmill very much, Mm -hmm. I put the TV on because then I can watch whatever crazy show I want. And I kind of forget that I'm on there. So I kind of do a little mental trick for myself. um, And it accelerates the weight loss loss process. And it doesn't have to be complicated. This doesn't have to be difficult. But it does have to be um, get your heart rate up a little bit. So, yeah. so you know, anything, even just a fast walk, a nice fast walk. And um, at the time, I literally uh, have had, like, a lot of joint issues with bones and knees and feet, and I wasn't really able to run. Um, but the funny thing is I started um, – trying to help my son because he was trying to get ready for a football season and he had to do all these crazy exercises so I said well I'll go out with you and I'll be your coach which is really kind of funny because I have no business (laughs) doing that whatsoever so we're out in this big field and he's showing me these um he's showing me these like crazy exercises where you like you crisscross your legs back and forth and and then he's showing me how you kind of like dive to the ground and then he's showing me how you like he literally is running around this field well I started doing it with him now, I wasn't as fast. I probably looked like an insane person. But I was sitting there doing these crisscrosses, and then I was like doing the, the you know, run and touch, run and touch. And then I started mm-hmm. to jog a little bit. And what I found is working with him for less than two weeks, all of a sudden, jog. And this is something I really never thought I'd be able to because I had low back issues and I had some knee yeah, issues and I yeah. had some ankle issues. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, the body responds to repetition like a champ. So even if you think you can't run or if you think you can't do something, that is not the way the body is programmed. The body eventually will support whatever you're trying to do 
because uh, unfortunately we lose, like, I hate to say this, as we hit middle age, we lose like a quarter pound to half a pound of muscle a year we can lose. So yeah. part of the reason you want to be doing these different things, whether it be yoga, tai chi, anything that feels good that gets, you know, allows you to support yourself, is you can counteract that muscle loss. That's why some people, you notice when they get older, they can look frail even though they haven't gained or lost any weight. It's because the muscle kind of deteriorates. So if you just get your exercise up a little bit, do some gross motor, do something for some strengthening to keep those muscles moving, try a few new things that you probably never thought you could do, but do them on simple, easy, easy, easy. Your body will transform in less than like two months. And so... Um, so I'm all for trying to find that great number that you love, that you want to resonate with, and then letting it, allowing the process to happen. And yeah. so, um, and after that, once you start listening to your body, the funny thing is those set points. I know you mentioned set points. The cool thing about a set point is that you do have, and I was at 190, and I had this weird set point at 162 that was just so hard to break. Once I got that for those first 30 off, I was like, it's never coming. I'm never going to get out of a size 15. Yes. You know, and I was uh-huh. like, oh, it made me almost, brought me to tears. Uh-huh. But I'm like, I'm not going <laughs> to, no way. This is not going to beat me. So I started realizing that my portions were still equal to the person eating a size 16. Yeah. So I cut my portions down. It was never a full sandwich anymore. I started eating a half a sandwich. And in less than a week, my body adjusted to the lower calories. So you need to eat. I always say eat like a toddler. Yeah. Because toddlers, if you sit there and watch them, they eat like nothing. But they're they're running around all day. They're burning calories like crazy. And they eat so little. Most of it's on the floor. You know, they toss it or they, they're throwing it. And <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> isn't it? You know, you're like, how do they survive when they've had like a handful of food, but they're fine and they're off running, and you know. And uh-huh. so I thought, I'm going to start eating like a toddler. This is one of my other crazy tips. And I have not gone back to a full sandwich since. And I'm you know, just totally, I'm stuffed on half a sandwich. I don't. Whatever you're eating, uh-huh. you probably need half of it. <laughs> the body needs half of it. You may want all, all of it, but the body doesn't need that much. Yeah. So, I um, we we we're, we like I said to the squirrel thing. Back to the squirrel reference. I like save all the half of my sandwiches. So in my fridge is like tons of leftovers because it makes it, weirdly it makes me happy. I bring it home and I put it in the fridge. So so watch the portions. Just cut back even a quarter sandwich. Cut back a couple bites. Start anywhere. Cut back a little bit. Get moving a little bit. Set your set your mind on what your perfect, you know, what what your ideal would be, whatever that might be, and allow it to melt. And seriously, oh, I love that. Yeah, that visualization, and it will. And, and you know what does. you say about the portions. I have found Diane is that when you start to really look at, and I grew up in a, I I grew up in an Italian family, where we ate. You know, food was certainly something we enjoyed. <laughs> and um, even though, you know, when I was younger, I was able to get away with that. Um, but um, I have found that if you pay attention, you don't feel good if you eat too much. After you have eaten too much, you do not feel good. And so if you just, and I don't mean even just emotionally or anything, none of that. You know, just physically eating too much doesn't really feel very good. I mean, you feel, if you can just think about how do I want to feel, you know, then suddenly you really can cut back this a couple bites here. And, you know, dessert, that's not my biggest issue. It's mostly portions I have found, um, is that if I'm eating something I really enjoy, you know, you want more of it. And, and you know, probably just the, the way I was raised, I don't know. I mean, it's just something that that's with me. But, um, it's just a matter, like you say, you don't. I'm finding myself saying more and more, do you really need, you know, that that extra whatever, or, you know, you know, and you find out that that you feel perfectly satisfied if you just stop and pause, if mm-hmm. you just pause for a minute, suddenly you don't want any more. You're done. And and so anyway, I I do relate so much. I'm glad we talked about this. I I know that we've talked about it for a while, but truthfully, it's not a topic. 
that has been discussed very much on this show, and yet I feel that so many of us relate to it, and it, it really does help us with our love for ourselves, you know, no matter where we are. And, you know, I feel that that, that sense of vitality, and for me, I walk a lot. I've talked on the show a lot. I walk a lot, and I'm doing yoga now. In fact, I did yoga Yay. and walking today. I took my days in reverse. I'm actually taking today mostly off because I know I'm going to be working all weekend like you at the expo. And so today's kind of my in- middle of the week part way off day <laughs> and so I, I walked and I had yoga and I never thought I could do yoga you know when you say the things that you never thought you could do I never thought I'd be coordinated enough and I'm not saying I do it perfectly by any means but I can do it and I love it absolutely love it well I have to throw in about the yoga when I first mm-hmm. started because I've had all these body issues I thought okay I can't do it Everything's going to hurt. I literally could put my hands, if I bent over, my hands basically touched about my knees. Mm -hmm. And I had these sore palms, and I had a bad lower back. So honestly, Susan, I literally, I look kind of like the UPS guy. I would put this belt around my waist. I put gloves on my hand, and I I had to put, like, special thing on my feet, because everything, I thought, every, well, everything did hurt when I was trying to start yoga. And I'm like, okay, I look like a total crazy person. I look like somebody's trying to deliver a package here because I had those, like, utility belts <laughs> and everything. And I'm like, I don't care. I don't care what they, I don't care what anybody else thinks about me with these flowing yogis over here. I am going to make sure that I get strong. I just wanted to get my flexibility yeah. back. I wanted to get my mobility back. That's all I wanted. And so mm-hmm. I wore these silly gloves. I cut the fingertips off <laughs> winter gloves. I mean, this is seriously with the crazy stuff I do. I cut the fingertips off those. I have these belts on. And I'm sitting here, and after it took me, I made a commitment with the yoga. Yoga is, um, a, a tip on yoga is that it's not a short-term fix. You can't, I'm right. sure you've learned that. You can't just go to yoga once or twice and go, okay, I do yoga. Yoga is <laughs> about getting your flexibility back so, again, your body responds to the repetition, and it becomes a fluid, stronger, like, mechanism. And so I, when I did it, I made a commitment for, even though I was, cre- I was in pain, it was hard for me to do, and I had to dress in this crazy stuff. I'm like, I'm going to do this for one year no matter what. I said I was yeah. going to commit to at least once a week. And it took me, it took me a long time. It took me about nine months. But in nine months' time, without breaking every single week, I only went once a week because that's all I could handle, and I'd need to recover in between, but I could literally, in nine months, I, I, my fingertips touched the floor, and I, like, yelled out in the middle of class. I'm like, I touched the floor. You know, it was like, oh, uh-huh. you know, because it was that kind of, it was that kind of um, no matter what focus. You know, it didn't matter about it. Can't be, can't be self conscious. You can't care what you look like. Can't care what you're dressed in, or if you right. can do what everybody else can do. Um, and and now, on a really good day, I can almost do the splits, almost pretty close. Wow! And well, you're but, <laughs> that's cool. But it's only because I committed. I've been doing it for like three years now. Uh huh. Yeah, and you know, I'm really still very much a beginner, but I will tell you, and I even had a break, so I I actually broke that rule, (laughs) not that I had a a rule, but but yeah, I started it and then I stopped it, and I only, I started it up again fairly recently, but I really noticed when I stopped it. I also, you know, I think that maybe at first I was kind of looking around at other people, but you know, I'm getting to the point where I don't do that as much anymore, because I just think to myself, fine. You know, because some people can do stuff and some people can't. And, and you know, sometimes I can do something fairly well, sometimes not. I mean, I'm such a learner. So um, it, it's amazing how I find that, um, you know, as you do it more, you become more focused on what you're doing. And a good teacher will, will advise you on that. And it's funny, I actually had a day today where I was called out a few times, Susan, fix this, or Susan, adjust that. And, you know, (laughs) if I had been in my old gym school, you know, gym class mindset, that might have been embarrassing. And yet it really wasn't. I was appreciative because, you know, I just needed some extra adjusting today. And so that, and, and, you know, you don't want to injure yourself. So, so anyway, it's something that I'm finding really helps. And you notice, you notice, I mean, even in the simplest of ways, like you 
drop something on the floor and you go to pick it up and suddenly you're realizing, oh, my gosh, there's a difference. I mean, you don't even really know where it's coming from, but you're just noticing my body is changing. I can tell. So it, and it's, it's the it's, best thing you could do. They call it the watch asana. Mm-hmm. My, my one teacher called it a watch asana. Which uh-huh. is, uh, she, she goes, now, you guys, I know you're all doing the watch asana, which means to, like, look around and watch what everybody else is doing. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I started, everybody started laughing because it's true. I think we're so ego, we can't help it. Yeah. You know, we, we do have, a, yeah. you know, we have strong egos, and they're playing their role all the time in our lives. But when she said that, the whole class started laughing, and she said, I want you to only look at what's on your rectangle, which is your mat. Mm-hmm. And it was really funny because we're like, yeah, 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 okay, fine. So then everybody kind of stopped I hate to say, but comparing, judging, or oh, yeah. sitting here and saying, it's, it's you know, I had to really work on that. I'll be honest with you. It's my, um, I like, I used to be in dance and everything, so I like to kind of be competitive yeah. that way. And yeah. it's something that I've had to temper and watch myself because I will, I will out, I will try to do things that I know I can do, but maybe would not be the best for thing for me. Yeah. So I've I've gone too far. I will tell you, I've I did once. I did two headstands uh, because the teacher said to do it, and everybody around me was doing it. And the second one was probably created a little bit of an issue. So I I knew I was doing it, and I was mad. I was really upset with myself after because I knew better than that. I knew my body wasn't able to withstand that, you know, to do it twice. It was over the top. So anyway, so it was really good for me to learn, though. I learned about um, only doing what you can do, only doing what feels good, not trying to put myself in that competitive mindset. So I've learned more from yoga um, about life, about life and about myself. And I thought, so totally... Uh, whatever whatever works for you that gives you that strength, you know, just some of that, build that muscle back up and be able to, you know, build the muscles in the joints. I'm all for it. So I'm so happy for you. I'm so happy yeah, that it, you're back with us on yoga. It, it really is a good time in my life where things are, um, you know, sometimes you just, when you're when you're changing, you can really feel it. And and I think we all go through those times, and I'm I'm really feeling it right now. Um, you know, this this episodes going by so fast um i want to switch gears and talk a little bit actually you know what now would be a good time um to talk a little bit more about um life rebooting in general you know what it is that um you know you assist people with Diane, and then maybe we'll also have some time to talk about relationships. I swear we may have to do a third show together just to <laughs> focus on that. I mean, this is what happens every time. Last time we talked about business a long, long time, and it was great. And, you know, this time I really think this is helpful information for people to, I mean, because the weight thing is really important to a lot of people. And I think it helps to see that, look, here's this teacher. She's teaching all over the place. She's a dancer. She's an actress. And she has this honest story. And you know, we just can really relate to it. And so so I think that's important. But let's talk about life rebooting a little bit, Diane, and, and what, what it is you're 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 helping people with and what you're going to do this weekend for my listeners in Portland and the whole Oregon, Washington area. Yes, yes, yes. I'm so excited. Um, I have a, a workshop, and they're called Life Reboot Workshops. We'll be having one this Sunday. It's at noon. It's at the Body, Mind, Spirit Expo in Portland, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to to do it. It is just a huge gift for me to be able to even offer the workshop because I have so much fun and learn so much, and I, I'm able to watch people literally transform in about two hours. So the workshops have a format where what we what we do is it's very experiential. The first part, uh, of, of the workshop, and we've been able to offer this. I've been able to do this all over the country now. Is to go through a little bit of the educational part uh, in the real brass ring. I have put together the 14 shortcuts for happy living, and that is how I completely transformed my life. And it's how I use. It's the the basis for how I use um, these tools to help people that I do private coaching with because I'm able to coach people all over the country. I have people in Seattle and California and everywhere. I think it's 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 all coasts, <laughs> both coasts and yes, in the center yes. of the country. And we go over these 14 shortcuts. And they are helpful, useful, very practical tools that you can use to do a couple things. The first one I call is get clear. 
it's so many of us know from early on in in our past or in our childhood very often what is the right path what gets you excited what are the things that you love to do what is a part of you that is that passionate part that resonates at this really high level and gets you smiling and and, and in the flow. And so we spend a lot of time going through exercises that help you get super, super clear on that. It's kind of like a uh, re-energizing who you really are. So we spend a lot of time on authenticity, and then we spend a lot of time on how we're going to start what I call get going. How are we going to take these now that we remember what, what is our authentic path, our soul path, our true purpose, what are we going to do now to get going and to activate that? Um, one of the challenges that I've, I've found, and, and oftentimes we'll see in the workshop, people will have these breakthroughs and they'll say, oh my gosh, these are the things that were right for me. This is my perfect formula. This is what works for me. And they're not doing any of it, none of it. And what we, what we talk about in the workshop is our entire life is designed to identify this path, your purpose, to know yeah. what you believe in, who you are, and what you actually love and came here to do, and then to do it. So we take part of our session as well during this workshop to talk about how we can get that into our lives now so we can actually employ these things. And what it does is it takes people who are off track in particular or someone who has you know, this true deep desire but they've never utilized it or they just started and sometimes what happens is they, they, they dabbled in something that they felt was right for them but then mm-hmm. it went slightly off track and then they yeah. back up. And then yeah. they don't do it. They they're like, oh, that that was a. F- I had I had one client, and it just broke my heart. She came to me, and she's like, you know, I I tried to go into this new business, and it, I felt like it was perfect, but my mother didn't approve of it. My father was always uh, putting me down, and my husband didn't support it. She said, and the business failed, and now I'm a failure. And I said, no, you're not a failure. No. You're courageous. <laughs> yes. You just need to shift. You don't quit. You shift yeah. so that you can yeah. make it so that that energy that you had that that decided your you know your thought that decided now I'm a failure is probably what brought your business to a close. Mm-hmm. It wasn't the fact that you know you couldn't uh, show self love or appreciation or compassion and say, oh my God, what great courageous move I made. All you needed to do is change your model slightly and maybe recraft it, maybe a new location, maybe do something slightly different, but get back to where you love what you're doing. And so so she had this huge breakthrough. Uh, she's contacted me, actually, and told me how grateful she is. And mm-hmm. she realized that the only reason she wasn't succeeding then was because I called, you know, thoughts are are little bubbles. They're bubbles of mm-hmm. they're bubbles of nothing. <laughs> they're bubbles of energy, of ideas. Yeah. And she yeah. broke her bubble and now is going back to what she loves to do. She has had great communication with her family saying, you know, I don't have to have your support. I'd like your support, but if you don't have it, I love myself enough to do what's right for me. And she is completely recrafting her life and so delightfully happy that she she even circled back to to tell me about her progress and we're going to we're going to keep in touch and so i get to help celebrate people people's success and celebrate them refining their authenticity and then getting super clear get going and then what happens is of course the the wonderful part is people get happy and oh, if we were good. all walking around happy mm-hmm. can you imagine what a great place we'd have here yes Yes, and and I think that that you have found the keys to finding more joy. I think in in life is I love how you teach people to simply reflect upon what they truly love to do. You know, I mean, it sounds so simple, and yet so often we stray from that. And then to actually do it, <laughs> and and to to refine it if you need to, and. And um, I, I feel like you're you're just helping so many people, and and I hope that people do have the opportunity to see you this weekend here or wherever you're at, um, and in in the many workshops that you do of different lengths, and and um, it, it's wonderful that that you're coming out here because it's a rare opportunity for my listeners here. Um, it's a it's a really good opportunity to come um, for a couple of hours and see some real real change happen quickly. So so 
So, yeah, I'm glad that we we had a chance to talk about that. And now we still have time left. You know, usually I, I actually reverse that a little. A lot of times I'll do that at the end of the show, and then I always feel like we get cut off. And so I'm really glad that we had a chance to talk about what you're going to be doing because I feel it's really going to be helpful for people this weekend. Um, and, you know, we still do have time Diane, to talk at least a little bit. This may be a teaser for a future show. But, <laughs> you know, your book, it it talks so much about your journey with relationships um, and also parenting. That's another, there's another show for you. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but but when, when, you know, there are people, I know that, that some of the, the shows when, when we have people on who are maybe giving advice to people and we have callers, you know, caller after caller after caller, it, it's usually a relationship question of some kind. And so I wonder if you could at least approach that topic from, from your own experience for people who are, you know, experiencing difficulties or just feeling like, you know what, I'm just never going to gonna find the right situation or maybe dating. You have all kinds of dating stories in your book that are really interesting. So, so yeah, see what, see what you can do with that in the time that we have <laughs> left, Diane. Okay, another two of my other favorite topics in addition to food is Parenting and, and relationships, um, yeah. the fun the fun part of life, right? Um, right. And parenting is is awesome, and we can go on to that at another time because um, I have all kinds of tips in that area. Uh, but the part about relationships, and this is, um, I like to kind of cut through, if you don't mind, kind of to the chase, mm-hmm. kind of cut to the bottom yeah. line. In in existing relationships, and and this is one where you have a relationship, and you know. And and so often I hear, especially with my you know with my private clients, that the relationship is stale or the relationship is um, not not where they want it to be. It's not resonating at a supportive level. It's not resonating at an emotional level, and it it really comes down to a couple of things. And this is the part that, you know, I wish I wish that we spent more time even educating our kids on how to have a healthy relationship so that we didn't have to muddle through. But what it usually comes down to is the first part is about being super truthful. And that means micro-truthing, which is kind of the concept from Gay Hendricks and his whole book about conscious loving. I've been able to kind of take that at, full length in in all of my relationships, not only my personal relationship, but everywhere. And it changes your world. It it is a way to actually get super clear about what it is that you, is your truth in the moment without having the other person, you don't put it on the other person. So there's kind of a little trick to it. It's a communication formula. And if, for example, let's say, let's just say, Susan, you said something that I felt was hurtful, let's just say. You said Diane's mean or something. And I would be able to say, Susan, <laughs> when you when you when you said these words, you know, Diane's mean, I felt and you talk about how you feel. So you go right to how yeah. you feel. I felt hurt, I felt um I felt dissed, I felt surprised, I felt all these things and I I didn't know that that, you know, that truly took me off guard. And uh, you get right to, you, I don't put it on you. And I usually add in a piece where you say, I'm sure you didn't even know. Usually the person has no mm-hmm. idea that they're not supporting you or they don't know that they made a slight or they made or they made yeah. some kind of judgment call. And you can say, I'm sure you didn't even know. But what I'd like you to ask you to do in the future is to, um, is to uh, maybe be more thoughtful or maybe be a little more uh, careful with your words next time. So there's ways you can frame it up where you're asking for what you need. And the most important part is you talk about the need that wasn't met. And that's the part that most people are missing in relationships. When people feel the relationship is stale or there's something that would be so much more helpful for them, they don't express it and they never have the chance to say, the need that's not met is this. And I literally just recently practiced this with my own relationship, and I was, um, you know, my, my fiancé um, and I, we were talking about it, and I say, I want us to take a minute and do what needs aren't being met right now. <laughs> 
And he usually yeah. looks at me like, oh, my God, you're going to make me do another exercise. I'm like, yes, I am. But it was really funny because we both came up with the same unmet need. We were being kind of distant. We were both doing our own thing. We were kind of charging off on our own course. And he said, I don't feel emotionally supported by you. And this is a man, which, you know, sometimes I don't want to grossly generalize, but sometimes it's hard for harder for men to express themselves that way. And I yeah. said, I don't feel emotionally supported by you either. And he, and we looked at each other and we're like, okay, so we're both not giving what the other person's looking for. And it yeah. was really funny. It was as if all the all that, like, stirred up pot energy dissipated. We were kind of able to almost, I'm not going to say we were laughing about it, but we were kind of like made it light. And mm-hmm. I said, okay, well, what could I do to maybe show you some more emotional support? And he goes, hey, I said, you know, I need more hugs. I mean, I'm not getting hugs. I'm not getting, <laughs> yeah. I, it, you know, I even I even found that putting a, a warm, toasty towel on felt more like a hug than I get from you when I said stuff like that to him. And he looks at me, he's like, okay, well, that's kind of, you know, okay, fine. I can see that you need more hugs. I'm like, yeah. And, and I could, you know, what if you actually um, made a thoughtful, you know, gesture to me? And then he, you know, and he he made some very simple requests uh, that I was able to easily, easily do once you hear, once you get to that heart space. Yeah, it's amazing yeah, it's how the key. person you're in a relationship with is becomes again the good guy. Yeah. Not not the one that you have to, you know, have have a have an adversarial relationship because it was it was really a really simple way to take that little friction that was kind of building up. It goes away. Everybody wants to give each other what they need. I mean, I think as human beings and as good people, we all want to do that. So, so it's really it was really a nice way or a really simple way for us to to settle a friction that was kind of building up. And so that's what I really encourage people to do, especially in the relationship. You know, what needs aren't being met? How do you say it in a way where someone can hear it? Because the challenge is sometimes they'll say, "Well, you're not, you're not." doing nice things for me you know and you, sometimes the other person will say are you kidding me you know and they get defensive they get a defensive right. posture right. and then it turns into a you against me thing it doesn't be, mm-hmm. become an us and a loving thing it becomes this um this friction and so you, it, it becomes very simple when you're able to say things in a way where it's not on the other person there's no judgment you're able to express how you feel and then you really can talk about what simple solution there might be in the future. And I, I've, I've found that this is so enormously successful in relationships that it can take one that has become quite cold and warm those relationships up right away. So that's kind of in the current relationship situation about being super clean, super clear, in the moment, expressing how you feel. And, and the other key, key, key thing there is um, if you're a stuffer like I am, I've noticed that when I don't respond in the moment and I'll let like four things go that really bothered me, hurt me, or irritated me, it comes out so inappropriately on the fifth time. <laughs> you know, oh. there's that, you know, like, yes. it, I'm not my cool, calm, clear yeah. self. I'll be like, yeah. what do you mean? Uh, mm-hmm. you, know, you always, there's that, there's that word, you always, you know, go to the store and don't even think about what we need. Well, you know, the poor guy was just driving by and went to the store to grab what he was looking for. He wasn't thinking about what we needed. So it's just because four other things stuffed in behind that, it came totally inappropriate out of my mouth. That created a fight, and it didn't even need to be there. So I found that if I stop stuffing my feelings and I express them in the moment, and I'll say, gee, you know, next time, if you're going to go to the store, can you kind of tell me because there's like 30 things that we need here too, very simple request, can you get the bread and the milk and, and the butter and the eggs like we always need? And and he's like, sure, of course. So then it becomes a, co- a collaborative situation. So so don't stuff. Be clear. Be truthful to yourself and your partner in an honest and loving way. And relationships usually have a tendency to get much, much, much more healthy. And the other thing is you got to leave time for play. And I find that a lot of the relationships that people have had them for a long time – it's all about the doing, and it's all about the taking care of the kids, and it's all about you know just trying to take a minute and relax when you get home. But you, we we schedule playtime. You know what would be fun and get us both in that like, remember what it was like to date mode. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. when it's fun and it's exciting and you're exploring things together. And so we're really conscious about that and saying, okay, we both love adventure, so we try to create adventures at least once a week where we're going to a new place, checking out a new restaurant, uh, maybe going to a show, doing whatever will give us both that excitement and that um, 
the part that makes the relationship feel like it's fresh and 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 loving and this is like a cool partner i have instead of oh it's you <laughs> you know it's you who just came in the door um <laughs> so so that those are some of the tips for um for people who are in long term relationships and in fresh new relationships that's where you get to really set the slate. That's where you get to really create this platform of what works for you. Because one of the key things is people are always telling you what they're going to do. And this was, uh, it's part that, uh, it's just human nature. I think we hear it. People will say, um, I, I just had a crazy situation where someone broke up with this client and, and she said, well, the first thing he said to me is that he had had a uh, let's just say out of wedlock relationship in his first marriage with the babysitter Mm -hmm. and i said okay so you knew that from the minute you met the guy you continued to date him you went through um, a tough time with him and you really were not clear that he was a person who was having trouble with commitment you know it's People are usually telling us exactly what they're going to do. They tell us who they are all the time. It's just when we don't listen to it. So maybe this is a person who had commitment issues. Maybe he, he, you know, this is how he likes to act out. And so when he um, had did the same thing to her, the client was able to see he had a pattern going on. She participated in the pattern and she supported it. She did it completely knowing that this is something that he already told her he had had multiple times when he could not be faithful to his partner, and um, was still devastated when he wasn't faithful to her. And I'll just say, well, you know, you need to take responsibility for your part in that. You need to be aware that you participated in this and that you were not receiving the information that was coming in. And that, you know, she was able to turn it into gratitude for having learned what she learned. She turned it into, you know, more commitment to finding um, people in the future who are going to be uh, in committed relationships and want to be in a committed relationship and were, you know, had better track record with that. And and so we were able to turn the whole situation around where it was um, gratitude instead of, you know, once again, I'm with a guy who, who's not being, um, in, who's not able to be faithful. And so, you know, a lot of it has to do with our awareness, uh, taking full responsibility. But when you're in those new relationships, listen up, <laughs> turn the ears on. People are always telling you, things sometimes they sound like crazy things and we they can always um, my clients almost always go back to the first time they heard something that sounded off and then they wonder why after dating for a year or so the person you know um whether whether whatever it might be whether they had issues with addiction or sometimes they had you know you know very strange habits or you know they're not clean or whatever whatever things come up and i say well how how long did you know that this was coming you're like oh usually it was like in the first month so it's like that, and if those things are deal breakers for you, it's better to end the relationships sooner than later and find someone that really gets you, uh, meets you at, at this beautiful level where it's more of a partnership, a real soul partnership, instead of um, taking like the person, the first person that comes along and knowing that it might not be a nice blend for you, a nice match. So those yeah. are some of my tips for um, uh, for dating. Wow, that was good in a nutshell. And you know what? We're racing to the end of the live show. We're not going to get cut off because I have a feeling we're going to finish in the podcast. Those of you who want to listen to the very end, you need to call right now, 310-807-5104. If you're listening live, you can go on the teleconference line and listen to the last part of the show. I um, want to tell the live audience that's leaving, um, liveyoureverything.com is Diane's site, bmse.net. is the Body, Mind, Spirit Expo. Just go over there. The Portland Expo's up there. And um, just uh, ending the live audience off, and, and hopefully that, that you've benefited live audience from all of this. And, and do listen to the rest of the podcast. Come back and listen. So um, now what I want to say, now that now that we're just finishing the show, we're technically we're recording for the podcast now, um, is um, well. First of all, I want to say thank you again, Diane. Is I have once again enjoyed listening to all the insights that you have to share, and you know I I really feel you're the kind of guest that um, well your book just keeps on giving because it it covers so many so many vital areas in our life. 
And um, the shows are much the same. I mean, we can certainly, there's just so much we could explore. So, so thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I absolutely love spending time with you, and I, I'm so excited uh, to be able to actually meet you in person and give you a big hug. So I'm looking oh, forward to seeing too. you in two days, a couple days. <laughs> I can't wait, and I bet there are, there are listeners out there that are really looking forward to coming and, and seeing you in person, too. And, you know, I am just so looking forward to seeing you, Diane. This this will be fun. So. So take care, and thank you so much, and and I would just love to have you back on again to explore some more. (laughs) It would be my pleasure. Thank you again. All right. Well, take care. 